Now, aspect ratios. Is it a technical term, a creative term, a long-held tradition from the early days of filmmaking, or maybe even a storytelling device? Well, the answer to that is yes. Aspect ratios are all of those things and more, and the history and use of various aspect ratios is something that has fascinated me since the beginning of my career. Hey there, I'm Tom Graham for Envato Tuts Plus, and I have a not-so-secret affection for the history of the aspect ratio. If you're an aspiring filmmaker, a photographer who is looking toward the world of video, a student cinematographer, or even just a movie buff who loves learning everything there is to know about the filmmaking process, then you've no doubt come across the term aspect ratio before. So what is an aspect ratio and how does it relate to the filmmaking process? Well, all of that and more in a moment, but right now, have you subscribed to the Envato Tuts Plus YouTube channel yet? If not, all you need to do is click that little red subscribe button below don't miss out on all of the great creative tutorials that we're putting out daily. Get subscribed right now. To dive deeper into aspect ratios, we first need to understand what the term means. Well, quite simply, an aspect ratio is the relationship between the width of an image and the height of an image. And the most common aspect ratio in this day and age is 16 by 9. And we'll get back to our friend 16 by 9 a little later on in the story. Aspect ratios are written as ratios, obviously, so you've got 16 by 9 or 4 by 3, that's another common one. But they can also be written out as decimal. So you might have seen 1.85, 2.20, 2.39, for example. These are the decimal way of describing ratios, but those decimals can also be described as a ratio. So you might sometimes see 2.39 to 1. All of these ways of writing them are just describing the relationship between the width and the height of the image. So now that we know technically what an aspect ratio is, the next question is how that appears in our content. Well, you've probably heard talk of black bars before or letterboxing. Well, this has everything to do with aspect ratios. Those black bars that appear either at the top and bottom or left and right of your image depends on the aspect ratio of the screen that you're viewing the image on and also the aspect ratio of the image itself. If they are both the same ratio, then you will have a full screen image with no black bars. If the aspect ratio is mismatched, then the black bars will appear on screen in order to refit the mismatched image to your screen, so that the entire image can be displayed, opting to lose screen real estate over losing any part of the actual image. So what's the historical context for these different kinds of aspect ratios? Well, to unpack that, we first must cast our mind back to the pioneering days of early cinema. But before we jump into our time machine, let's quickly talk about our sponsor, Invito Elements. If you're creating content for the internet, then you need to be on Invito Elements. It's a fantastic subscription service that gives you access to literally millions of digital assets that you can download and use in your projects right away. Things like music, stock footage, video templates, fonts, and much more. Everything that a modern content creator could possibly need. Plus, it's downright affordable. Check out the link in the description today and see for yourself what Invito Elements has to offer. But let's get back to our history lesson. So in the early 1900s, Eastman Kodak, yes, that Kodak, was mass manufacturing 35mm film and at the same time, Thomas Edison, yes, that Edison, is tinkering with early versions of what would become a film projector. At this point in time, it was more of a box that a solo viewer would peer into in order to view the projected image. Through his tinkering, Edison decided that the perfect image size for his machine would be four perforations high on a roll of 35mm film. Perforations being the small holes on the side of the film that are used to drag the film at a set rate through the camera and past the gate, which is the film camera version of a sensor. And then when the film was developed and run through a projector, perforations would be used to drag the film at a set rate between the bulb and the lens in order to project the image at the same rate of motion that it was captured in. A 4 perforation high image on 35mm film ended up being 4 by 3 in aspect ratio. This soon became the industry standard ratio in America and would go on to be the ratio in which the vast majority of silent films were captured in. And it remained that way until the early 1930s when the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, yes that academy, officially changed the standard to accommodate the space needed on a 35mm film print to capture onset sound which in turn squeezed out the image and thus changed the aspect ratio. They declared that the top and bottom of the image must be masked off to retain the classic 4x3 shape but also allow for the recording of audio onto the same piece of celluloid. The resulting mask didn't quite fit into a 4x3 box and instead we were left with what is commonly referred to as the Academy Ratio, or 1.375 to 1. It's very close to 4x3. All things aspect ratio remained essentially the same for the next couple of decades until everyone caught a whopping case of widescreen madness in the 1950s which resulted in a number of companies and famous directors all trying to outdo each other with how wide they could make their images. 
a lot of directors at the time shared the consensus that human vision is wider than a 4x3 box, so why shouldn't their films be? There are some great examples of the wacky and wonderful aspect ratios we saw in this era, and one of those is the unforgettable Cinerama, which was a feat of technical wizardry and madness that resulted in the use of three specially constructed cameras shooting side by side at very specific angles, and then being projected by three side by side projectors onto a huge curved screen with a final displayed aspect ratio of 2.59 to 1. A lot of experimentation was done in Cinerama, but ultimately only a couple of films were ever completed in the format, including the film How the West Was Won, which saw theatres in 1962. Let's move on to another term that you've most likely heard of over the years, and that's Vista Vision. If you've ever had to study Hitchcock films in school, then you'll be familiar with this as Alfred loved to shoot in the Vista Vision process, which yielded a resulting aspect ratio of 1.85 to 1. The process for capturing films in this aspect ratio was a little bit different, so instead of recording images lengthways between the two lines of perforations, the filmmakers literally pivoted the way the film was fed past the gate by 90 degrees and began recording the film widthways between the lines of perforations, thus resulting in an image that ended up being 8 perforations long versus the old traditional 4 perforations high. And the best part was that once everything was all said and done and the film was ready to be displayed to audiences, the finished film would then be reprinted back onto 35mm film in the traditional orientation so that it was able to be projected with standard equipment in all contemporary picture theatres. But let's jump forward in time briefly to 2009 and to J.J. Abrams' little reboot of Star Trek. Now, this is most certainly not the only example in this category, but I feel like it was potentially the most memed example that I can remember, so a little bit to talk about there. Yes, I'm talking about lens flares, and specifically anamorphic lens flares. That big, wide strip of light that pierces through the middle of the screen in dramatic fashion any time even but a hint of light dares to make its way toward the lens. But how does that relate to aspect ratios? Well, I'm glad you asked. The term in the middle there, anamorphic, was integral to the 1950s Who Can Have the Widest Films competition, and the technique is otherwise known by the name Cinemascope. This technique, when using a 2 to 1 anamorphic lens, yields an aspect ratio of 2.35 to 1, which is a very common modern widescreen aspect ratio. Anamorphic lenses work by making use of specially designed optics that squeeze the big wide image into a tighter little 35mm plane. It squishes everything in on the sides and makes things look a bit tall and funky, but obviously that's not how it ends up looking in the final product. To correct the image back to normal, another lens is used on the projector that has the inverse effect of the anamorphic element on the camera lens, and it achieves what is commonly known as de-squeezing, resulting in the case of a 2 to 1 anamorphic lens with an image that is 100% wider than what was captured. The anamorphic look has become a desired aesthetic in its own right since the adoption into the film industry back in the 50s, and many lens manufacturers are creating new and rehousing old anamorphic lenses to work with modern digital cinema cameras but more on the aesthetic uses of aspect ratios later on in the video. So it might seem like squeezing and then de-squeezing the image is a real hassle. Why not just use wider film? Well, it was mostly due to the availability and mass manufacture of the 35mm film at the time, but there were some filmmakers and manufacturers who chose to go down the route of working with larger film stock. This large format film stock was often 65 or 70 millimeters and it resulted in a whopping 2.20 to 1 ratio that projected some truly larger than life results onto the big screen. The best known early example of a film captured on 70 millimeter film stock is The Sound of Music in 1965. And remember, this is just three years after How the West Was Won was released on Cinerama, achieving an image that wasn't quite as wide but was in every sense of the word much easier and cheaper to capture and display. But sticking with the 60s for just a little moment longer, remember I talked about Cinemascope with their anamorphic lenses? Well, around that time, a small company called Panavision, yes, that Panavision, if you've ever seen the behind the scenes photos of a movie set, you'll have seen someone in the camera department wearing their shirts or their hats. Well, they began manufacturing anamorphic lenses for use with 35mm cameras, as well as developing camera technologies that were able to capture large format prints using 65 and 70mm film and more traditional spherical lenses. You've probably heard of Lawrence of Arabia before. Well, this debuted in 1962 with an aspect ratio of 2.20 to 1, the same as The Sound of Music, and not far off How the West Was Won, all within the space of a couple of years apart from each other, but all utilising very different technologies to achieve that wide look. Moving on from film, let's talk about television and how we landed on 16.9 as our standard aspect ratio for the modern era, 
Well, it's quite simple really. Films that were able to be displayed in theatres were able to make use of wide aspect ratios because screens and projectors could accommodate them. However, with the invention of television, creators were now literally boxed in. So if you wanted to make something that was to be displayed on a TV set, it would need to be framed for and presented in 4x3. Cinema releases continued to shoot in wide formats, which is why we think of these expanded aspect ratios when hearing the term cinematic. It was cinematic in comparison to television. 16x9 is mathematically the compromise between the wider cinematic ratios and the 4x3 ratio of early television sets. When modern televisions were being developed with expanded capabilities in resolution and screen real estate, the compromise was made and 16x9 was deemed to be the standard going forward. Let's have a look at how both a cinematic 2.35 to 1 image and a 4x3 image can be easily displayed on the 16x9 screen. You can see, just by cropping the top or the sides, it easily fits onto a modern screen, and you can understand why that aspect ratio was landed on. Now that we know some of the fascinating history of the aspect ratio, and how, why, and when these technologies were developed, how can we bring that into the modern realm of filmmaking? And more importantly, how can we bring that into our own work as content creators? Well, that's a perfect segue into talking about the aspect ratio as a storytelling device. Yes, even though it is entirely born from the technical ins and outs of camera and projector technology, it totally is and can be used as a storytelling device, and many of your favourite films and TV shows creatively use different aspect ratios to achieve different results. Take the Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson. This film tells one story over three time periods and employs different aspect ratios to denote each time period. Elements of the story that take place in the 1980s are presented in a 1.85 to 1 ratio, and the parts of the stories in the 1960s are reflected in the 240 to 1 anamorphic ratio, which as we now know is very indicative of the time period. And then finally we have the scene set in the 1930s and that's captured in the academy ratio of 1.37 to 1. What are some of your personal favourite films or television shows that use different aspect ratios to help further the narrative? Let me know down in the comments, I'd love to keep chatting about it. So how do you choose what aspect ratio to shoot your films in or deliver animations in? Well, as a creator, it's completely up to you, but here's a few thought starters. Wider aspect ratios are great for capturing big, sweeping landscapes and wide vistas. You're able to frame close-ups of your characters whilst also being able to display wide environments around them. Star Wars is a classic example of this. It's also great for framing multiple characters together, fantastic for films with large ensemble casts. So maybe look at a wider aspect ratio if you want to capture stunning natural vistas or if you're creating a fantasy epic like Star Wars. If you're telling a story that is going to revolve around two types of characters, either human or otherwise, that are kind of varying in height, then maybe look at taller aspect ratios for ease in framing. Jurassic Park is a good example of this. You have small humans framed up next to towering dinosaurs, and a tall aspect ratio allows for the framing of both in comfortable fashion. Whereas a wide aspect ratio might fit our humans in the frame, but we'd be lopping off the head of our poor T-Rex. Or maybe you're making a gritty crime drama rooted in the realities of the characters' lives, and you want to keep the audience engrossed. A more standard aspect ratio closer to the field of vision of normal human sight might serve your story better. Or perhaps you want to take the Wes Anderson route and change things up depending on the scene. Well, a great example of this can be found in countless documentaries, where you would see the on-camera talent being interviewed in a standard 16x9 frame, and then any reenactments or supporting b-roll would often be presented in a wider, often 2.35 to 1 ratio. If you're a gamer, you'll be very familiar with this change in aspect ratio. Cutscenes in video games are often referred to as cinematics, and will commonly shift from the playable full-screen perspective to a wider cinematic ratio that serves to further the story. Like I said at the top of the video, aspect ratios are fascinatingly complex for something so subtle. No matter the content we watch, the genre, the medium, or even the surface we watch it on, the aspect ratio will be there front and centre, and will often serve to inform us as viewers about something that may be happening on screen. It's a great way to inject some creativity into something that's just always there, but it was born from 100 plus years of technical innovation. And even in the modern era of content creation, we are seeing the continued evolution of the humble aspect ratio in the rise of vertical video on mobile, with platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube Shorts, to name a few, employing non-standard aspect ratios designed to best suit the device in hand. So if you're involved in creating content, I want you to think about everything that you've learned in this video and how you can take that into your own work. How can you use it to your advantage to help tell your story, develop your characters, and excite your audience?
And if you're a movie buff or a TV nerd, I want you to look closer at those black bars at the top and bottom of your screen and watch for subtle changes in the aspect ratio. And then think about what the filmmakers are trying to say by changing the way that the image is presented to you. Now I hope you liked this video, I had a blast making it, I know it's a little bit different for our channel, but if you did like it, hit the subscribe button below and let me know in the comments what are some of your favourite aspect ratio facts. And don't forget to check out Invito Elements today, there's an almost endless supply of video content on the platform, and you guessed it, all with different aspect ratios. So check out what's on offer today by clicking the link in the description below.